Who's going to be the first one, the most, you know? Yeah, yeah. Actually. Yes, you do. So there is a mic for the audience, and there is a mic Ex shared. By Excellent. You. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to see you, all of you here. I hope people are watching online. You are also participating in this panel, uh, the panel uh, at the Heinz Kabutz session at J Prime. So the topic for this panel is the future of Java, and this is in the most broad sense possible, which means that uh, the questions that we are looking forward to are about the technology, about the community, about the platform, about the language and other languages, and ecosystem, tooling, whatever bothers you currently, and you are interested in hearing from the panel about what will, what will the future bring, uh, you are uh, welcome to ask the questions. I have a couple of questions that I came up with beforehand, so you don't have to be like very creative right off the bat. Uh, and we'll start with those. Before we jump into the questions and the interesting part, uh, let's just do an elevator pitch of everyone on the panel. So my name is Alex Shalaev, and I work as a developer advocate for GraalVM project at Oracle Labs. So I, yeah, and everyone else should just take 10, 15 seconds to Tell us why you're here and why people should listen to you. Volker, you're up. So hi, I'm Volker Simonis. I'm working for SAP in the SAP JVM team. I'm representing SAP in the JCP Executive Committee in the Java 9, 10, 11 expert group. I'm the OpenJDK project lead for the PowerPC and the AX S390 porting projects, which SAP is doing in the OpenJDK and the hotspot developer since more than 10 years. Uh, David Blevins and work a lot in the Java EE, now Jakarta EE space. Uh, I work for Tommy Tribe and do all the work no one else wants to do. Uh, and then we are also on the JCP Executive Committee and also the Eclipse Board. Uh, so that's, that's generally us. Uh, Venkat Subramanium, uh, training, consulting, mentoring, and uh, just hanging around. <laughs> Andro Mihani. I'm a Java E developer working with the Pyra team and uh, MicroProfile teams, and I hope to, uh, hope to work with uh, Jakarta EE and the Eclipse Foundation. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, just a Pyra guy and uh, Java EE guy, then hel helping, to, trying to help others to use and uh, love Java EE. All right, Milan Jankov, I work as a developer advocate for Liferay, uh, dealing mostly with um, modular solutions based mostly on OSGI these days, started with portals a long time ago. Um, now in uh, watching closely uh, what's going on with JPMS and, um, and the modularity in Java in general. Hi, I'm Sebastian Blanc. I work for Red Hat, uh, I work for the middleware team, and we are using Java and Java EE daily. And I really believe in Java EE and in the future of Java. But I'm like Venkat, I'm just hanging around here. Hi, I'm Kirk Pepperdine. I have no idea why I'm here, but. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Clarity. Oh, right, Jay Clarity. Uh, oh, yeah, right. Uh, J Clarity, we do uh, performance diagnostic engines. Yeah, so it will be a little bit of circus running back and forth. Okay, so let's tr let's start with a with a uh, basic question of not maybe the future of Java, because to understand the future, we should kind of acknowledge the. Uh, present and maybe know what happened in the past. So what trends do you see in the current development of Java? And just name maybe or elaborate on the most important to you and you can pick your your choice. Do you want to talk about Java as a platform, as an ecosystem uh, or as a community? And if you don't want to talk about the current trends, you don't have to. But let's, 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 who wants to start? Let's start this way at our way around, right? Kirk. Trends, current. Trends, uh, a lot more community involvement. Um, we see a lot uh, more work being done on the JVM internals by the community than we have in the past. Um, and I think we're gonna see that trend continue. There's gonna just be a lot more stuff happening from the community 
ending up inside the JVM. And that means the trend is that uh, the JVM is going to be a lot friendlier to the type of runtimes that we're, the modern runtimes that we're seeing evolve today. Uh, well, yeah, you are speaking about a trend. I can really feel some changes since a few months. Uh, one year ago, people were still making jokes about people doing Java IE, and, and it's less and less the case. And I feel there's some changing happening right now. Maybe Jakarta microprofile health steps. So I'm really confident for the future. So from like community is definitely one of the, the, the changes that is like very, very vis visible, especially with like the whole shift of Java EE and a bunch of technologies to more um, <clears throat> how to say, um, uh, wider uh, a group of, of companies, people uh, taking responsibility for delivering, for moving it forward. Um, another thing that I personally see is um, uh, a lot more uh, Java into the uh, IoT world with uh, machine learning, and, and which at some point seems to be an area where Java was kind of a second player, which doesn't prevent people like someone I talked today to say that, or our legacy is Java and our current code is Scala. But um, yeah, I guess we're always going to get that. <clears throat> So, so as it was said, I, I, I also agree that the community is growing much much more than uh, it used to be. And I see the trend that uh, the community and people are un more and more united, while in the past we've seen trends which uh, were dividing the community. Like there was always uh, this uh, war, let's say war, or arguments uh, between uh, Spring and Java E camps, and now uh, People are more, more, and more, more and more working together with uh, also companies like Lightband, which are completely different on, on the, the basis. Uh, they cooperate with uh, other companies that, that are, are doing something different, but uh, everybody is trying to find uh, common grounds to move things forward, which, which is great, because uh, the power of community also means that uh, prob most probably Java uh, itself uh, as, a, as a platform and as the ecosystem will remain because there's no single like uh, single vendor or company uh, holding things tight even, even though Oracle is uh, ha uh, has lots of uh, lots of uh, legal uh, uh, like access to, to the Java development but with the open JDK, op open source, and Java E coming to Eclipse Foundation, and uh, also other projects like uh, uh, Java FX being open, so the community has more, much more access. Uh, I would say two things. So one, from the point of view of the um, language itself, I think Java 8 really showed that uh, a language that doesn't, doesn't evolve is going to die. So from that point of view, I think the message has been really strong and clear. Looking uh, at uh, the developments in the language itself, I'm really positive to see things that are coming up. Uh, so that's definitely, I think, that's a trend where Java is going to continue to evolve to be a lot more stronger than it's been over the past. I, I think the next five years is going to be a lot more stronger than the next 15 years. That's kind of, uh, the past 15 years. Uh, I'm very positive about it. The other thing that also kind of snuck up a little bit is uh, libraries support for uh, reactive programming. So many different libraries are moving in that direction. Uh, when I started talking about it about maybe 10 years ago, I said, hey, in the future, we'll be excited about it. Well, that's the future now. I, I see so many libraries moving in that direction, which I think is really positive as well. Yeah, I th so I got a couple aspects, and I'll, I'll give uh, a, a, a negative and a positive, just so I can balance it out. But uh, so. One, so I'll go to the negative first so it sounds positive in the end. We're all still using Java 8 every time I give a presentation to ask who's using something beyond Java 9 or beyond Java 8, and everyone's still at 8. And I'm kind of wondering, is this going to be a problem for us in two years? Um, so that's, that's a bit of a question, and I think that will be a challenge for us and something we should focus on and talk about, which is why I mentioned it, because we should upgrade. We're hurting ourselves by not upgrading. So we should get going a little bit faster. Um, 
Yeah. So then the other thing which is really interesting is with all the open sourcing of things that's been happening, uh, IBM open sourcing J9, Open Liberty, uh, Java EE getting open sourced as Jakarta EE MicroProfile, which basically started an open source. Um, all the open sourcing that's happening, we're starting to see a lot more people come into the game and participate. So since Jakarta EE was announced and MicroProfile two years before that, we've started seeing companies like Microsoft and Lightben come in and say that they want to help out, which we haven't seen companies come to the table at this number at the same time since the very early days of, of Java when the JCP started and we had companies like, you know, Bluestone and, you know, whatever, uh, all kind of collaborating to create things. So uh, that usually is a good thing. And having this many number of companies starting to participate in developing things in the Java space, uh, not just in their corner, but together, is, I think, the mixture for something really good to happen. Alibaba just came on yesterday, uh, which I think is a significant uh, breakthrough in the sense that uh, uh, Chinese companies have not really cooperated in the community uh, to date. So this is a, a, a real interesting development, I think. And that's a huge uh, uh, jet that they've actually submitted. So uh, to me, this is a, a, an interesting shift. And uh, last, last week, I was actually in Japan. And I think we uh, made some significant breakthroughs with the development community there in terms of being able to bridge uh, between Japan and the rest of the community. They do a lot of wonderful things, but they tend to do it all in Japanese, and they tend to be inward-looking and not outward-looking. And so I think even there, we're seeing some bridges being made that actually didn't exist before. So this is really uh, growing at an interesting rate now. So let me see whether, whether I... I got them four. <laughs> Thank you. Not one of them. No. Oh, three. For me. <laughs> Adieu. Adieu. Thank you. Go on. This is fine. So from a VM guy of perspective, I, I want to concentrate on Java SE and on OpenJDK. So of course, it's good that OpenJDK is an open source project. But in reality, I think it's still dominated by Oracle, especially the development in the, in the VM is still actually only driven by Oracle. All the new upcoming features like value objects, all the new, the, the better Java native integration, that's all driven by Oracle. Um, and still, the, the hotspot is the, the predominant VM and the Oracle JDK, which is used by many people. So now with the new release cadence and the new support model, Oracle choose for the Open JDK this may change, and it's good that uh, we have with uh, Eclipse J9 an, alter uh, an alternative virtual machine, um, but uh, the future will show how, uh, if, if this will be really adopted uh, by, by many projects, because in reality, I think like 99% of the people are still using OpenJDK or Oracle JDK based VMs. So we'll oh. be into The, the trend is, uh, and this is, I guess, supported by the LCJ, it's the London Java community, is actually has a build farm now where you can get um, all of the OpenJDK builds uh, from them and the Growl ones and, and everything. And uh, this effort is actually being heavily supported by Oracle because I get the feeling that Oracle w wants out of the, the business of distributing their own special JVM. And um, uh, maybe Vincat knows more, but... Yeah. Share. <laughs> yes, but I, I, I totally agree and uh, I appreciate what Adopt Open JDK is doing. But let's uh, let's put it uh, let's see the reality. So they Adopt Open JDK is currently only building Open JDK sources, which are still maintained by Oracle. So all the security fixes, all the updates are still done by Oracle for Java 8. When Oracle will stop doing this in January next year. Then we will see who will step up in the community and support Java 8 
for the next two or three years uh, with security updates, with bug fixes, with all the stuff. So there must be some, some players like, I don't know, IBM, Red Hat, SAP, but currently we don't see who, who will do this. And the same for all the LTS releases. LTS, is, it's, the people still misunderstand it. LTS, it's, it's a vendor-specific tag. It's not an open JDK feature. Open JDK 11 won't be an LTS release until somebody from the community will step up after six months and take over the responsibility because Oracle will only support Java 11 for six months in the Open JDK. Azul currently uh, supports uh, Open JDK 6 project in, uh, and, and does security fixes for that, yes. But it's not clear if we have these LTS releases and new releases every six months, who will do that? So that, that's a huge question. Did you want to add? I, I think one of the things that's going to really get resolved is, you know, we've seen this in other languages and other communities as well, to your point, when uh, big corporations don't support it anymore. Are the active users really interested in participating and moving it forward? I think that's a very important concern. Um, but I think what's going to happen here is, as time goes on, the big corporations that have a lot of money will probably buy the license from Oracle and say, be done with it, or other vendors. And uh, unless there is a force within the organizations that really get motivated to say, no, we need to really put the support to maintain it. Uh, so in fact, I would say this is really, and to your point, I think, is a really a good test of open source. Because a lot of times when we talk about open source, we say, hey, this is great. I can use it. Well, do you have a skin in the game? That's the question. I think that's a really good, good point. I'm going to disagree with you. Um, uh, I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, there might be a, a number of large corporations that are um, going to and, you know, sort of pony up for support from Oracle, but I think the trend, especially in technology companies, has been to grow an internal JVM team uh, that actually does internal support. I mean, this is common at Twitter, it's common at Google, and it's common at Goldman Sachs, it's common at, uh, you know, at Alibaba. Well, and that's the issue. The, uh, you're, right, you're right, none of them contribute. This is a really interesting um, development from Alibaba, but Twitter has not contributed. And that's a real issue. Uh, they, Amazon has not counted. Google tried, but didn't want to follow through properly. It's, not, yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a debatable point, but there was some follow through work that they didn't want to take on. That's, that is the truth uh, in, the, in that set. Whether it was made up follow through work or real follow through work, I mean, that's a debatable point. Um, and, and the point is, is that we, we know that, I mean, to become um, capable to manage the JVM or to contribute to code internal of the JVM takes a long time. It takes like uh, engineers about two to three years in order to be able to be productive in this environment. So for someone to come along and just say, oh yeah, we can just now contribute code to the JVM, it's like going, yeah, let's, you know. So in, the, in this regard, I think Oracle has been a, uh, has been a reasonably good gate, gatekeeper in, in making sure that the JVM um, is coherent. You know, what's been put in is actually coherent in general purpose, but, um, but I think, and in, in this is, you know, that's one issue, but the other issue is just the support costs that Oracle is putting on companies is basically saying it's cheaper for us to spin up our own JVM teams. And I think in the long run, this is actually going to be better for the community because it means there's more resource, more people out there that are going to have skills in developing internal to the JVM itself. Uh, right now, that skill set is really tied up inside Oracle for all intents and purposes until we figure out a way to get uh, you know, contributions from these other, other companies that do want to contribute, but for some reason can't. Can I just add something? So I think it's like in general, uh, there are two, uh, two approaches to that. Like when you, when you talk, like, uh, uh, like companies like Twitter and Google, like the big players aside, be, uh, because they, you know, have their own interest in 
collaborating or not collaborating with Oracle uh, on that. But there is like this this huge difference between when you go to like the, the regular Java folks who just code out there, and there's the expectation that there's going to be a new thing in Java coming up like every month or every like like six months, like minimum. Like they want Java to be the language that catches up with all the cool things. Like we we want to release like ASAP. Like give it to us. Give all this new stuff to us now. And then you go to a enterprise companies, and I'm not talking about like the, the, the you know, Fortune 500, but any like an average size bank, and you're gonna hear that they cannot upgrade just like that, and it's like two years process or three years process, or they sometimes gonna ask you for five or seven years um, support. Um, so those are like the, the, the two edges of the, of the same problem. You can't, uh, you can't be evolving something uh, uh, and you're releasing new stuff every like second, every month, and at the same time, provide uh, like long-term support for I don't know five or seven years so this is where I see the space where companies will need to step in and fill the gap someone has to be someone has to provide the the support the security fixes the whatever it's needed for those companies for those banks for those insurance companies for those telecoms for whatever who are will never contribute to the java ecosystem themselves but they still need someone to support them and and someone just kind of have to do this whether that's going to be oracle or someone else uh, but there's clearly a space for someone to actually do that now then we can talk about the quality of, of, of that service, but that's a different question. So I, I would, uh, the, the interesting thing about this is, like, for your response, Kirk, you started out saying that you disagreed with Venkat, but then you ultimately agreed with them at the end that this is the opportunity for us diverse, to diversify the leadership of the language in the JVM management and main, maintenance, that more people outside of Oracle will be forced to learn how and have businesses around maintaining the JVM. And uh, you, you kind of got there in the end, and if you don't agree, then you can go ahead and, and take the mic again. But, but, but my point is, is we have been doing open source wrong for the last 20 years, uh, and we still, have, we still haven't learned how to make sustainable open source. And sustainable open source is never one contributor that does everything. And so we often go, oh, Oracle, you in your big, strong control of Java, and we get mad, but ultimately we're not ponying up any resources in people or dollars to change the, the game, right? And so this is an opportunity. Uh, when Oracle was giving away all the support for free for many years, there was really hard for, for small companies like Azul to actually have a business to pay people to come to work and do patches for the JVM or do any feature enhancements for the JVM because there's no money to pay those people. And so that created a vacuum of competition and a vacuum for any opportunities, not because uh, that Oracle pushed out all competition because nobody wanted to put money on the language because, well, I'm already getting it for free. So they're not doing it for quite free anymore, and that does mean that it's uncomfortable, but is it wrong to support open source? No, if, you, if we really think that this thing is valuable for us, it should be worth at least a dollar. And if there's uh, eight you know, billion people uh, using Java, and they all spent one dollar, that'd be eight billion dollars to keep the language going. That would be easy business right there. But since we can't find it in our hearts to give one, we need a few people to give some, and this is kind of basically forcing the leadership of the language to diversify, which could ultimately be a very healthy thing for us if we acknowledge our responsibility that as consumers of open source, we either need to contribute or contribute resources or, or money, you know, people or money. That's basically, that's basically your responsibility as a consumer of open source. So your thoughts on the role of the foundation in all of this? Which, my thoughts on the role of which foundation? A foundation. A foundation? Something, something after, you know, beyond Oracle. Well, um, so we'll let Venkat take the, take the microphone, but if we're, if we're giving our dollars to Azul, and some people give their dollars to Red Hat, and some people give their dollars to IBM or whatever, 
that will make more JVMs or at least more JVM engineers exist and in a diversified way that isn't just simply one company. Um, having one foundation that would control all the JVM, it, it's good, but it's really ultimately better if there are separate entities that are responsible. So that's a critical thing to right now. I, I think there are a couple of things that I think we tend to forget. Um, one point you made, Kirk, is you know, it's, it's not easy to contribute code to the core JVM. Uh, but there's another aspect to it which we should also um, keep in mind. Uh, one is people you know, need to have the skills, but also from the business point of view, I'll ask the question, what is the core competency of the business? And if when I'm running a business, my core competency is running that business, not in maintaining Java. So from the business point of view, that's one of the reasons why companies have been reluctant in taking other technologies as well, is because that's not their core competency. So I think what's really going to happen is not that these companies that are actively using Java, I don't believe, are going to start contributing to Java. They are more than willing to pay money for somebody else to be contributing to Java. I think the diversity is going to not come from the users actively, but from other people who have core competency to take that forward. And, and that's not a bad thing, but I think that's the, that's the way it's going to move forward, I think. Okay, oh, yeah, exactly. I think I'll kick off the question from the audience oh, as well. Oh, yeah, sure. um, I have my first question. We're talking about Java as a platform, as a you know, as an ecosystem. What about the Java as a language? I mean, academically language. So we see a lot of evolutions. You know, all this var stuff. It looks more like like a JavaScript right now. It's very hard to distinguish somehow Java and JavaScript. Um, what do you think about the evolution? Should actually Kotlin take over the leadership as a as a language? I mean, the majority of the code should be written in something like this. And uh, what about Java? That too many evolutions uh, happening. Well, the recent years. What is your opinion here? <laughs> well, I, I want to. It's, it's a balancing act, but I want to emphasize a language that doesn't evolve will definitely die. And uh, in fact, uh, I was one of the people on the other side of the picket line constantly complaining that Java sucks uh, back before Java 8 is, is specifically for that reason. But, but having said that, uh, I'll, I'll challenge in, uh, uh, Brian Getz here. He made a really interesting point. Uh, he said Java will not be the language I'm obviously paraphrasing his words, but Java will not be the language that does the innovation in the language space because that's way too risky. Java doesn't have the luxury of putting things in and then saying, oops, and changing it. Uh, I have a deepest respect for a lot of other languages, Scala included, for that very reason, because they bravely try things and then they say, well, these things don't work and we can change it. Java doesn't have that luxury. But having said that, I think they're taking a really balancing act and that is to you know, kind of shop around, so to use the word, and see which features actually make sense from other languages. And then they are cautiously bringing those into the language. And I think that the, the, the growth is not for the sake of growth. A uh, couple of things that have been really bothering us. One is verbosity in the language. Uh, too much boilerplated code. And uh, if Java can evolve to the fact where we don't have as much, as much boilerplating, I think that's really powerful. There are some really good capabilities like pattern matching. Uh, I think they're very selectively adopting features that have been tried and tested in other languages. And I think uh, that, that's the real right direction for the language. I'm, I'm very positive in that area. Yeah, I would, I would add, I, I agree on the large extent that other languages contributed contribute very heavily to the success of Java as a language because they can try stuff out and they're all in JVMs so that really makes them close to our ecosystem. Um, and the functional additions were fantastic. Uh, I absolutely think that's amazing. The var stuff, I was a little bit skeptical on that one and, and uh, I don't think it's there yet but if Java becomes Perl and like there's more than one way to do everything, I think you know that would be something to be concerned about. But I don't know that we're there yet, but, but it, you know, I've, what, what makes me nervous about adding something like var now is that uh, everybody's still on eight. 
And so we're starting to add major language features in a time when people are not upgrading to the, to the next JVM version. So the number of people vetting and giving feedback, uh, that pool of people is like a fraction of what it is. So the feedback loop uh, is, is really low. So if just from a business perspective, I would not add major language features while my user base isn't caught up because I know I would be having a high risk that I'm not able to get feedback from the large majority of my industry, right? So I would first get them caught up and then I would start adding features in just so that I could know I could get the feedback loop, simply from a business perspective. This becomes worse with the incubating VM and language features which are now planned starting with Java 11. Because as you say, we have no real feed, good feedback loop and we can, it, the new incubating and uh, language and VM features make it possible to easily add features which then can be taken back or changed. So we get a lot of different Java versions which, which support different features without having real feedback. It will be hard. Yeah. And coming, coming to that, there was just a question on Twitter that if people currently struggle with updating to the latest releases, imagine five years forward, we have different versions of Java every six months, a new version. There are different capabilities, features are added and removed. Do you think it will be a much like, larger struggle? Should, be, should we even like, uh, fragment this, the ecosystem this way? Uh, so that, that is uh, an interesting point to add to that rather than the question. But coming back to the languages uh, and the experimenting, what about other JVM languages? which kind of pave the road forward to the features that are easier, easier to integrate back into Java. So currently Kotlin seems to be like uh, at a hype wave or at like high interest, right? Before, over the course of like 20 years, we had multiple killers of Java, which were different languages. So some of them, it didn't work out, right? Uh, several years ago, Scala was kind of like the best JVM language uh, the most advanced one, right? Now it seems that scholar community uh, is taken aback a little bit. So do you think, do you think languages like that are uh, a good way to figure out the feedback and what features should be taken into Java? And do you think any of the languages could be the next Java, like in a proper sense, overtaking the larger parts of ecosystem? Right, so to, to the previous point, um, yeah, uh, sorry, um, let, me, let me reset. Um, I think to answer this particular question, we have to ask the question, you know, what has made languages successful in the past? And I think, uh, yeah, I think Java has clearly shown that people prefer stability over just about anything else. And what I think is that what you saw in the other languages was some instability, certainly with Scala. I mean, you know, a few years ago, everybody thought Scala was going to be, you know, the, the bee's knees. And, um, and, you know, there's certainly a lot of noteworthy things in there. But I, when we looked at it, we said, okay, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of issues. And one of the issues was a lack of stability. And I think that was probably one of the uh, killer things. It's like, you know, if I can't take code that I've written to, you know, like last year and run it in today, this year's runtime, then, you know, that's for me as a business point of view, a, a, a showstopper because that means every year I have to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again with no benefit other than to upgrade to the recent runtime. And, you know, in terms of the, sorry, there was, there was some, about the, these release cycles, I think there's a bit of a, mm, a misassumption in terms of people keeping, keeping up with release cycles. I think it's going to be easier to keep up with release cycles in the future. The problem is getting the whole thing jump-started. So we're still working with last year's model uh, with you know, tomorrow's release you know, cycle. And I think that over time, as people get used to the new release cycle, this is just gonna get easier for a lot of places. There are some places that are gonna be resistant to the change, they're always gonna be a problem, um, and they have legitimate reasons for being resistant to the change, but I think in general, it's gonna, like, you know, from a tooling company perspective, I mean, going to nine just basically kicked the crap out of us, 
in terms of what we had to do to, adjust, to adapt to 9. Uh, but to 10, no issues. To 11, no issues. Right? We can, we, we can adapt very quickly uh, to, to, to things as we're going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the topic of the language itself, um, there is this feature in Java, checked exceptions, that uh, oh, the only community that disagrees that checks ex uh, on checks exceptions is the Java community. Everyone pretty much agrees that this is a failed experiment. And uh, all the other, even JVM languages, have uh, opted to remove checked exceptions. Um, is there? Um, any movement to remove them from Java because this is a rare opportunity to remove something without breaking backward compatibility. Checked exceptions, you, you just let the compiler not check them. You're done. My, my answer is get over it. That's as simple as that. It's too hard a problem to really work with. <laughs> yeah, but if I can just add my two cents to it. <laughs> I agree with Venkat, but if, if we are talking about it, uh, I think uh, it's not a problem that we have checked exceptions. It's a problem that if we have too many of them in APIs because it's, it's hard to use it. But some, sometimes it, it makes sense to have them because they express something. And I think the language doesn't have to get rid of them, but to simplify using them. And uh, Java, I think, 8 wrote these uh, multi-catch blocks, so it simplifies handling them. And maybe the, there's something more that can be done about it, but there's no point in getting rid of them. Just for the sake of records, I really hate checked exceptions. Just want to put that out. Yeah. So I'm not trying to say it's good, but I'm really tired because there's nothing we can do about it. Right. Okay. Overheard. Venkat recommends checked I exceptions. Like, <laughs> I like checked exceptions. I always, I, yes, because unchecked exceptions are runtime failures. Checked, checked exceptions are application failures. And they should only be used in failures. And what I find is that people make incorrect assumptions all the time and they throw exceptions when they shouldn't be and that's the issue. So it's not checked exceptions, unchecked exceptions, it's that somebody, so I mean the, the, the one that I find really annoying is I do a lookup in a hash map and I don't find what I'm looking for so it throws an exception which is a really bad assumption on the API design. And uh, you know, so it's, that's an awful use of a checked exception. Um, but other than that, I th what I don't like is I don't like surprises. And unchecked exceptions are surprises. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to actually answer the, both the previous and this question in a, in a very unpopular uh, way, but that's my, like, uh, like my private and popular opinion is that Actually, the problem is we developers tend to compare things too much. Uh, and what I mean by that is when I remember when I started doing Java, I was coming from, for you know, obviously, basic and then C and then Pascal and then Perl. And then every time you move between languages, like the moment you reach some experience and uh, and, and some, um, um, you know, competence in some language, then you, you seek for those things in the next language. Uh, and then we start comparing things. And then Java comparing to, when well, no, that's ages ago, Comparing to I don't know Perl or or C was something totally different, and you, there are a bunch of things you appreciate and a bunch of things you hate and so forth. And today we have explosion of uh, uh, JavaScript developers and uh, what not languages, and there is way too much to compare. And this is I think the root cause of where all these questions keep popping up. It's like oh look at this other language, look how cool this is. I was like, can we please stop doing this? Can we please start looking at the language as a tool to solve a problem? Uh, because I, I ultimately, like that's, I, I'm not looking, for, I mean, from business, I mean, if I'm a, uh, a student, that's probably cool. I am probably get excited about, you know, the new feature. But working for a professional company, you're here to solve a business problem, right? And sometimes you have to write three more lines of code. And, and that's, that's not a reason to, be, to get mad on the language and request the whole language to be redesigned so you can write your code in one line instead of three lines. Um, and um, that's just my my private opinion on that is that we tend to compare things too much and say, like, oh, this little thing here, I want it here. It probably doesn't make sense. Like, may just get over it, as Venkat said. Just to be clear, uh, just to be clear, was that a, a deep compare or a shallow compare? 
<laughs> uh, I'll let you pick whichever you want. <laughs> so I have a sort of sort of related comment in the sense that my, my two f least favorite exceptions are IO exception and illegal state exception. Because uh, the majority of code that I encounter will catch one of them and throw the other, not necessarily at the same time, but those are the most common exceptions that I ever see. And both of them are completely meaningless. Like if you catch IO exception, what happened? Oh, something related to sending or receiving data. Okay, that's very specific. And an illegal state is basically the, basically I'm too lazy to program good exceptions and so therefore I'm gonna throw this runtime exception, which basically means something that should be happening is not happening. Oh, thank you very much for that. That saved me hours. So, uh, you know, the problem for me is not checked versus unchecked. You can be crappy coder in either. And so, you know, if, if, you're, not, if you're not gonna be a good coder and, and actually make specific, very specific exceptions that in, reflect what is actually happening at the moment, checked versus unchecked isn't gonna buy you anything. It's, 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 it's basically, it's, it's easy to be terrible coder in either. Uh, by my personal perspective, I, I don't see what would happen if we just shifted from one to the other. Uh, from an API design perspective, yeah, we have tended to favor unchecked exceptions versus checked exceptions uh, just as habit, but that still doesn't eliminate the need to be like a good coder in the most basic level. That's really where the bigger impact is. Yeah, there is a question yeah. in the audience. Yeah, from me. So uh, with the new release uh, cadence, so it has been briefly mentioned, so um, it's between a point and the question. So uh, one way to interpret interpreting the new release schedule is that uh, from the one side, uh, we have taken the old release model, we have uh, named it LTS, and we have put new versions in between this uh, uh, <clears throat> that were released. Some, for some features, some JVM features that were going into interim releases are now going into a big release and we announced them. Also some new features like VAR has been put in so that we could say that some big feature has been added to a release. So the question is, uh, uh, can we see, the, is, is this offering something to the community or it's just a marketing uh, feature that was, has been added to the <coughs> are you change? Ref the you're referring to is the fast release cycle valuable <coughs> and giving us something, is that the question? If that's one part of the question, and, uh, or, is it, uh, uh, it, or is it just a marketing thing that we, we will say that we are going faster, but in essence we have renamed our model and changed the bit and uh, we are expressing it with I'll, an I'll, LTS release. I'll take a quick stab and so we, because only have five minutes left. So uh, the, 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 the reality is, is that the pace of Java languages versions coming out has, has gotten slower and what made it very obvious was, was the modularity when Jigsaw was added. Uh, there were a lot of other language features such as the REPL and you know, the ability to compile things down to a native image. Uh, there were a lot of valuable features that were held for a very long time because there was a, a big box, we're gonna put all these features in this version number and it all has to wait until that one, everything's done. And so if there's one thing that takes a really, really long time, it holds the entire thing up. And so it is valid in a, to try and get these features out faster because there's what, imagine if you were two months late for the Java 7 release cycle, and then now you have to wait three years for Java 8 to be released, your code is sitting there for four years. Is that really healthy for Java? Not, not, not so much. So there is a real problem that's trying to be solved with the fast release cycle. Um, and, and, and I agree with Kirk, it's just a matter of us figuring out how to do it and getting used to it, um, and, and it'll be a little bit painful. And I did sort of say, now is the bad time for us to make language feature change. It's, it's a difficult problem because a lot of people say, why should I upgrade, because there's nothing that I want. So you kind of have to give them something that they want in order to get them to start upgrading. So it's a very difficult, difficult problem to solve, ultimately, it could result in things that were done four years ago getting into our lap in six months instead of four years. Uh, Venkat, last to... word, please. Venkat? Um, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let us, uh, thank you so much. We're out of time. Yeah, we have to do the closing. 
I believe it was a, a nice experiment for us. Uh, thank you very much for offering us and for participating. It was our honor. We are now going to close the conference in the other hall, so everybody's invited. Yes, sorry, I, I, I'm sure you, you'd, you'd uh, love to answer many more questions, but we have to close the conference and uh, we are afraid that the beer will run out before we do that. So please, let's go and close the conference and drink, and drink the beer afterwards. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you.